Good morning. Happy Easter. Thank you to everybody. Yeah. yeah it's a uh, wonderful morning. Sun is shining on Easter. Uh, I did a song this morning that some of you recognize for Easter sunrise called Then Came the Morning. And uh, this is a perfect example of it. Uh, the uh, pastor is held up for a little bit down at Friendly, but he will be here shortly. In the meantime, you're stuck with me. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to all the people online. Uh, it's a gorgeous morning, and we're glad to have you all uh, available with us this morning. We have some announcements, and I don't have a bulletin, uh, but I will pass along the ones I know. Uh, there will be no service this evening. Uh, we'll give you all family time and so forth. So no service this evening. Uh, is there a children, no kids stuff today? Okay, no young people stuff. Uh, so that's, uh, any other announcements? Anybody have an announcement? Kenny? Okay, yes, board meetings, trustees, financials tomorrow evening. And I think we do have one very special announcement this morning. Uh, we have some champions in our midst this morning again. Stand them up. There we go. I got a text from Diane just in time to get it, get into it on the second inning. And just as I turned it on, about 10 seconds later, the other team hit a home run. Uh, and I thought, oh boy, I probably shouldn't have done this. I'm full of bad luck. Uh, but they played a magnificent game. So it was terrific. And uh, I think all the folks that were there with them enjoyed the game and their week in Myrtle Beach. And I, uh, they, they, they did cause me to to commit one of the seven deadly sins, the one's called envy. Uh, <laughs> any other announcements? Does anybody have an announcement? Okay, still no pastor. All right. <laughs> Does anybody have a bulletin? What's what's next on the agenda? What? Oh, okay. The, uh, oh, thank you, Danny. The screen back there's not on. And there he is. <laughs> I'm waiting on my screen to come on. Apparently, oh, there it is. Okay. You want to do this part? Or? Okay. Uh, it's, called, it's our call to worship. If you all would stand, please. Run from fear and darkness. Hope is on the move. Do not be afraid. Jesus has conquered death. We can proclaim with great confidence that God's love rules. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. <laughs> oh. Well, I never said I was good at this. So. <laughs> Okay, now we'll turn it over to the eighteen. <laughs> Did you go over the announcements? Okay. Um, did you open with prayer? Did you open with a prayer? 
Okay. All right. Then we'll um, then we'll open with good morning. Great to have everybody here, and hello to those uh, watching online. Great to have you uh, with us. And uh, let us uh, we'll open with a word of prayer, followed by the Lord's prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we have gathered here today to worship you, to praise you, Lord. And Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, humble our hearts and prepare us to feel the nudging that you put on our hearts, Lord. Help us to grow our relationship with you. And on this day, Lord, as we celebrate your resurrection, Lord, Guide us and direct us to reorient, to focus ourselves on you. Help us to remember the sacrifices you made on behalf of all of us. Lord, help us to have that same excitement that Mary had once she realized, Lord, that you weren't dead, that you had risen. Lord, help us to carry your light of love of grace with us always. Lord, help it to shine brightly in all who believe. And now let us pray as the Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Uh, just a reminder, if you have not grabbed one, there are, there are April calendars straight back and over by the elevator, too. And uh, please make note... Uh, there's a board meeting tomorrow night. All the different committees will be meeting. Um, now uh, I will turn it over to the praise team. Piano song first, right? Good morning, church family. <laughs> I know we're Easter people 365 days a year, but especially today we gather with billions of Jesus followers around the world and celebrate the most significant event that happened in human history, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Please stand if you're able and let's worship him. He's 
alive, he is alive, he is alive, and I'm forgiven, heaven's gates are open wide, he is alive, he is alive, he is alive, and I'm forgiven, heaven's gates are open wide, he is alive, he is alive, he is alive, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. My Jesus is alive, 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 alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, alive forevermore, alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, my Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, my Jesus is alive. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph for his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain.
what you did for me, what you did for her, what you did for all of us. It's so worthy, it's so worthy, it's so worthy. Thank you. And I'm glad you're all back. Hey, you forgot to say, say hi to your neighbor. Hi, hi to your neighbor, everybody. What, uh, what praises do you have this morning? Definitely will keep that in prayer. Debbie? That's wonderful. Any any other prayer concerns, praises? No. I I go ahead. Debbie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Martha told me yesterday. He's still in the hospital. Any others? Thought I saw another hand up. May have just been seeing things. Okay, if there's uh, nothing else, then uh, let us take our uh, praises. And oh, um, I, I do have to say thank you for the prayers and uh, for my grandmother. The other day was her funeral and. Uh, I shared the prayer concern, the prayer, the prayers with the rest of the family, and uh, thank you for those. I could feel them. And you know, uh, I actually I used Gary what you said to me because I hadn't honestly I had not you know had looked at it that way. I'll be honest about how what you said about how. Glorious, I forget the words you use, glorious, I think it was, or awesome, or something like that, about how my grandmother, you know, March 31st was my earthly birthday, but now it's her heavenly birthday. And actually, March 31st also has another meaning for me, because my, I, 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 I had an uncle, my dad's oldest brother, who was born on March 31st. And we were exactly 40 years apart. He was 1942, I was 1982. And he passed away several years ago. And uh, so I feel like I, when I celebrate my birthday, 
with family, with friends that I'm also celebrating with him. And now I'm celebrating with her too. So thank you for what you said the other night. Um, anything else that I'm forgetting? Okay, if, if not, then let us uh, take our, our praises and our uh, prayer concerns to our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you have heard our, our prayer concerns, the ones spoken out loud as well as the ones that are in our hearts, Lord. You know our needs. Lord, we place these concerns in your loving arms and watch over those who are in need. Fill them with your, fill their hearts with your presence, Lord. Bring them comfort. Bring them strength, Lord. Lord, we know in your word you provide so many glorious examples of how you and only you can move mountains, how through you and your mighty power in your mercy that miracles can happen, Lord. So we place our concerns in your in your arms, Lord, and and help, help us, Lord, to trust in your will. To trust that you will, you will do what you know is right, Lord. And Lord, we also lift up to you our praises. And Lord, we, we love you and honor you and thank you for the love and the care you give each and every one of us for sustaining us, Lord, for providing what we need, for the doors you open, Lord, in our lives. On this day, Lord, we celebrate and honor your resurrection. And Lord, Allow us, grant us, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that you are in, alive in the hearts of each and every one of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, now we will recite, I invite you to stand up if you're able, and we'll recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Believe in the Holy Spirit, the church, the communion of saints, resurrection, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I forgot a line there. <laughs> um, you may be seated, sorry. All right. Um, we will be looking together this morning at John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. But before we uh, begin our reading, I would like to offer the, the following prayer. Father, anoint me with your Holy Spirit. And anoint those 
as well who will be hearing and receiving your word this morning. May it fill our hearts with your light, with your love, Lord. May it be used, may your word be used to inspire us. And may it be a reminder of the transformative power that is available through you and your Holy Spirit. Amen. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple were, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths laying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths laying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a piece by itself, a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as they, as yet, they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb, by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white setting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have hid him, laid him. Now... When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So what a day. What a life-changing and challenging week it had been. It had been a whirlwind. You know, Jesus, Jesus' arrest, interrogation, crucifixion, leading to his death on the cross. All of this had seen his faithful disciples scatter and hide. They shared with each other grief for a brother, a son, teacher, friend, lord and master who had been brutally murdered at the hands of the Romans and Jewish authorities. It had been three days since Jesus had hung on that cross. His faithful followers had all looked on, helplessly thinking, the end had come. 
asking God why God had allowed it to happen. Why he hadn't stepped in and stopped it. All of the prophecy, all of Jesus' teaching, all the lessons the disciples had learned suddenly were forgotten. The hearts of the disciples were broken. Their minds were confused. Clouds of darkness and grief surrounded them. They were alone and scared behind a door, a locked door, uncertain of what they were going to do next. Early on that Easter morning, Mary went to the tomb where Jesus' body laid. She felt compelled to go. She couldn't wait any longer. Now, the authorities had made sure that the entrance to the tomb had been properly sealed so that no one could get in. They didn't want anyone to claim that he had risen from the dead. He was dead, and they wanted it to stay that way. It was a Sunday morning, the start of a new week, the start of a new day, and it also marked a new beginning. All the hope, all the despair that had existed only days before was about to turn into great joy and great happiness. Mary approached the tomb, her eyes filled with tears. I would imagine her eyes were probably so red from crying and so was her face, I would imagine, just from crying. And she approaches the tomb. And the entrance to the tomb was open. Thoughts rushed through her mind. Someone has taken my Lord's body, she thought. Was it grave robbers? Was it the Jewish authorities? Were the Jewish authorities just not satisfied with killing him? Did they want to desecrate and mutilate his dead body also? But what she had failed to consider here was that he had risen from death. As I said, this was, he had predicted this many times. It was prophesied, but she wasn't considering this. She was, I would imagine, doing what we as humans do sometimes when we're dealing with grief, a tragedy, a difficult situation that seems like a nightmare. We're so focused on the problem at hand and not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel. And she was probably feeling that. She was scared and uncertain. And aren't we that way when we're dealing with insurmountable tragedy and, and heartache? Well, she ran to find Simon Peter to tell him of her discovery. Mary and Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, probably John, returned to the tomb to find overwhelming evidence that Jesus had risen from the dead. We know the tomb was empty. The strips of cloth that had been wrapped around his body were laying there empty, and the cloth that covered his head was folded and placed to the side, to one side. And yet, despite all of this, Peter still didn't see the evidence for what it was. He was blinded. Was he blinded by ignorance, grief, or just unable to process all the evidence? 
I would imagine Peter, too, was probably just so overwhelmed by grief that he wasn't able to maybe think things through. But when the other disciple entered the tomb, he saw, he understood, and he believed. Now they both left and returned to where they were staying. Mary, however, remained at the tomb weeping. She had been too afraid to go in, scared of what she might find, but she eventually gathered enough courage to go in. But then her grief turned to confusion. She had difficulty understanding what she was seeing. And his body was now gone. And angels, who were messengers from God, were in the place where Jesus once laid. The empty tomb and the claws were evidence to the two disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead. The angels gave Mary evidence of the resurrection. And Mary then goes on to receive the shock of her life as someone calls out her name. She eventually recognized Jesus standing right there in front of her. She reaches out to hold him, scared she might lose him again. But she doesn't understand the relationship is different now. They have a different bond. Now it's gone from the physical sense to one of a spiritual one. Mary took with her um, his, his message. And the same message for us of hope, of promise, of assurance. It was also a message of his message is, of, is also telling of love, forgiveness, which would all change the world forever. And you know, for me, something that I take away and provides me hope, and I would hope it would do the same for you, is that Mary is yet another example of how Jesus uses the most unlikely people. Here's a woman that had been a prostitute, who had been sinful. She was the one who was to play an important part in the resurrection story by sharing the news with others. God picks the most unlikely people. The Bible is full of examples of that. And I hope that you can find the hope in that that I do. Because he's called each and every one of us to ministry in some way, shape, or form. We're all ministers. And he gives us the tools to do the work. But here's this woman that had been a prostitute who was now given the responsibility of sharing the news with others. And she loved Jesus so much because he accepted her just as she was. He didn't give her a list of stipulations and say, okay, you meet all these requirements and then I'll welcome you into the fold. No. He accepted her just as she was and that is how the transformation began, be, begun. He showed her unconditional love. 
Well, we go on to see Mary frantically knocking on the door. The disciples who were inside didn't know who was trying to get in. Could it have been the authorities who had come in to round them up? The knocking got intense, but then they recognized it was Mary's voice. It was Mary with the news that changed everything. Jesus suffered for and on behalf of all of us, not just some of us, but all of us. And he did that for healing, for restoration, transformation, that same transformation that took Mary from being a prostitute to being the one who was going to deliver the message, the news. He suffered for the sins of all of us. And we all have to recognize, we all have to get off our pedestals and realize that each and every one of us are, sinner, are sinners. We're all broken people. And we've got to quit lying to ourselves that we're, we're good. We're not like them. We're good. No, you're not. We've got to remember that he suffered for all of us. And we're all sinners saved by his grace. We're all broken people. In some way, shape, or form, we're all broken. John Wesley once said, All need to be saved. All can be saved. All can know they are saved. And all can be saved to the uttermost. You know, I read a comment, commentary about this, about that quote I just read from Wesley, and it summed it up by saying, and, it, and I believe this is true, that quote, that's the heart of what the gospel is about. That all of us, not just some, but ev all of us need to be saved. And all of us can be saved. Perhaps there have been, or maybe there still are times in your life where you have found it difficult to understand a situation. Or maybe you have even found it hard to believe. Maybe you're in a situation where you're questioning God and asking why does he allow certain things to happen. You know, for example, when someone passes away, as humans, you know, we're unable sometimes to see through our grief. We're blinded like Peter was. Blinded by our own pain or inability to comprehend our problems. We feel wounded. As if God has left us alone and no longer cares for us. That's how the disciples felt. They were scared. They were alone. They felt alone. But this is far from the truth. He feels our sorrow and he shares our grief and knows our sadness. We don't understand. But God understands. We've been, over the last several weeks, have been studying a book on how to, how to allow God to help you develop a servant's heart. 
And and I and those who have been there, I'm sure would agree that a reoccurring point that Charles Stanley makes is that when we commit our lives to serving God, that's when we start understanding the reality of our purpose. We discover the answer to the old question, God, why am I here? When you're serving him, he shows you your purpose. And when we're serving God, we begin to understand that his presence is real. The resurrection for some can be very difficult to understand. It was difficult for Mary and Peter and all of the other disciples to understand. So you can rest assured it is okay for you, for me, to feel the same. But death is not the end. The resurrection is proof to the world that Jesus is alive. The power that brought him back from the dead can also bring back those who are spiritually dead. Look what it did for Mary. And it can do the same for you. It's when Jesus calls us by name, as he called Mary, that we begin to see the truth. You want to know how Jesus calls us by name? It's when you get that nudging that you should go do something for God. And, and when you try to deny it, and that feeling gets more and more to where you, it's so great that you can't deny it anymore. That's God calling you by name. And when you accept his nudgings, that's where peace comes in. That's where you experience true peace. This morning and every day, Jesus is going to continue to call people by name. Through his resurrection, he's asking now all of us to enter into a relationship with him. Or maybe you need to renew your relationship with him. But either way, respond to his invitation. That's what he wants. But the choice is ours. Here momentarily, we will join together for the sacrament of Holy Communion. And now's the time as you prepare yourself to come to the table to humble yourself repent of those sins that may be holding you back from him at a time to acknowledge the brokenness it's time to it's a, it's a time to reconnect with him Humble yourself before him and reconnect. And I'll add that all are welcome at the table. Use this time to re reconnect, to acknowledge your brokenness, and, and place those burdens in his arms. He's there to take them away.
Let's now join together for us uh, for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare our hearts for the sacrament of Holy Communion, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, guide us through examining our hearts. Lord, give us the courage we need to leave our burdens at the foot of your cross. Lord, for most of us, We've heard the resurrection story many, many times. Today, Lord, fill us with the excitement, the joy. the amazement that Mary felt once she realized your son, Jesus Christ, was alive. Fill us with that excitement, Lord. Lord, Help us to come to you like a child comes to a parent. Knock us off our pedestal. Convict us and show us all that we must acknowledge that it's your strength, your spirit that all that we do, all that we have is because of you not us Lord we fail you but yet here you are with your love and your grace keep us Lord ever mindful that we must turn to you with with honor and praise, Lord, for you're the one that makes all things possible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not thirst. With Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather around and wine, simple elements that speak of nourishment and of transformation. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you, we honor you, that you are close to us, that you're in every breath that we take, Lord. We honor you that your love is consistent. 
Your love is unconditional. Lord, prepare our hearts. Help us to tear down those walls so that we can truly feel your presence and feel you working on our hearts. And it humble us to be willing to receive your truth, Lord. And we, did, and we honor and praise you, Lord, for your love, mercy, and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You give us, Jesus Christ brings us the promise of transformation, which is seen in his life, death, in resurrection. May the Lord bless this wine, this cup, and this bread. And may, through this meal, may it make us the body of Christ. And that may it unify us to make us one with him. We remember on the night when Jesus and the disciples had their last meal together, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it, and as often as you do, remember me. And the symbol of this broken bread, we participate in the life of Christ and dedicate ourselves to being his disciples. In the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In the symbol of the cup, we participate in the new life that Christ brings to all those who come forth with a repentant heart, acknowledging your brokenness. If I could have the Coopers who have graciously offered to be our servers. And again, all are, are welcome at the table.
Please stand if you're able. The resurrection of Jesus proved that the creator of the universe has power over death. Uh, we know that death is not the end. We know that the worst situation, the worst diagnosis here on earth is not the last thing. And that gives us hope um, to do some pretty supernatural things uh, like loving and praying for our enemies and forgiving people who don't deserve it. So just remember that Jesus is in us all and he's very alive. Oh, uh-huh.